Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Although it might seem unfair, most military commanders are remembered by their biggest mistakes. A commander who has an otherwise stellar career can throw it all away with one foolish move. Such are the high stakes and risks involved with battlefield leadership. Make one wrong step, and not only will you wipe out your previous gains, you can even lose your life and destroy your legacy. During the Clone Wars, the Separatist Alliance had to cobble together a very diverse group of commanders to lead their massive droid army. You had individuals from the business world who had seen a lot of success, you had individuals from the corporate security world, and also individuals who had fought in local planetary defense forces. Many of these military leaders were driven to fight not only because of their political ideology and allegiance to their home worlds, who had joined the Separatist cause, but also the large cash handouts that the Confederacy of Independent Systems gave to their mercenary generals. When credits are dangled in front of individuals who are already partaking in a very dangerous profession, it can lead to more risk taking, which sometimes can be really detrimental. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at a group of very successful and competent separatist leaders who threw away everything because of one big mistake. The Oceanic World of Moncala, or DAC as it's known by the locals, has created many brilliant tacticians from Admiral Gale Akbar to Admiral Radis. My theory is that the Moncala are used to fighting underwater, which of course is a three-dimensional space. This gives these Moncala tacticians an advantage when it comes to space battles, which is fought of course in 3D space. But today we'll be talking about a lesser known Moncala hero named Commander Mirai. Widely hailed as one of the greatest commanders of his time and highly decorated for his actions against the ungodly squid monsters during the Korean War, Commander Mirai had a warrior's heart and was a very kind leader. He had great respect for his men. He saw them as his own family and had he asked his crew to follow him to the edge of the galaxy, I'm pretty sure they would have. Commander Mirai also had a very peculiar view on battle droids. He actually treated them with a lot of respect and valued them and didn't use them like expendable you know, battle droids. Unfortunately, like many great warriors, Commander Mirai liked to focus more on battlefield tactics than the galactic politics that drove most conflicts. He would find himself in the employment of the Corporate Alliance during the Clone Wars, and he'd be sent on a mission to destroy the cloning facilities on Kamino. Mirai foolishly believed the Corporate Alliance's overly optimistic assessments of the Kaminoan defenses and failed to do his own reconnaissance. He would send his fleet directly towards one of the most heavily guarded Republic worlds in the galaxy. He believed that he was fighting for the freedom of all individuals living in the galaxy. Mirai's forces would begin to suffer heavy casualties almost immediately. His ships began to disintegrate under withering Republic defensive fire. The Mon Cala commander would make the cardinal sin of abandoning his command post and take direct action himself. He would take his personal ship and carry out an assault on what he thought were the power sources that basically fueled the entire cloning operation. Unfortunately, this was a trap. The coordinates that he'd been given from the Corporate Alliance were false. Undeterred, Mirai then violently tries to attack the cloning facilities directly himself, but without any wingmen or supporting fire, he eventually abandons that attack because it is completely futile. Realizing that he's defeated, Mirai tells his forces to retreat, and in a last ditch effort to prevent the Jedi from following his forces, Mirai self-destructs his vessel right next to the Jedi's parked hyperspace rings. Mirai gets his honorable warrior's death, but ultimately, he was extremely foolish to not really check out the situation himself and just trust what the Corporate Alliance was saying to him. Watan Bor, foreman of the Techno Union, enjoyed unparalleled corporate success in the years leading up to the Clone Wars. What started out as a simple trade union spiraled out of control and turned into the largest manufacturing mega conglomerate in the galaxy. The Techno Union had a share of everything. They were responsible for manufacturing most of the battle droids used by the Separatist Droid Army. They had control over quad drive yards, which produced all of the capital ships of the Republic. Heck, they even controlled small arms manufacturing through their ownership of Blastech. Like all the powerful tech CEOs in our own world, it was hubris that would ultimately undermine Wat Tambor's ability to continue succeeding. And so, with his first command, he wouldn't just take a small unit to practice with. No, the great Wat Tambor believed that somehow his corporate experience would make him into an excellent field commander, and so he would take on the entire planetary invasion of Ryloth. Now, to be fair, Watanbor's initial invasion plan goes off without a hitch. 
With only a small Republic garrison on the planet, the CIS had a huge strategic advantage and victory was all but assured. Watan Bor, however, would make several small mistakes that would eventually lead to the downfall of the Separatist occupation on this planet. One, the ease of his victory created a false sense of security for Watan Bor, which meant that he failed to fortify his holdings after seizing the planet. Watan Bor also failed to eliminate Cham Sindula, leader of the Twilight Resistance, who would play a huge role in the future liberation of the planet. And lastly, Watan Bor cracked down hard on the populace and made life completely unbearable for most Twi'leks. This meant that most Twi'leks would really welcome regime change. On top of that, Watan Bor also pilfered what little wealth could be found on the planet and used these ill-gotten gains to enrich himself. It's no surprise that when the Republic arrived with a proper invasion fleet, they quickly overwhelmed every level of defense on the planet set up by Watan Bor. The Techno Union executive was absent as a leader during this phase of the battle, and he delegated command on the ground to his various tactical droids. To make matters worse, when it was clear that the capital city of Lesu would be lost, Watan Bor would avoid suggestions from his command droid to evacuate, and instead he would wait until the last moment to grab as much pilfered treasure as possible before fleeing. Such high-risk behavior would have been more welcomed in Wat Tambor's business world, but in real life, this can lead to dire consequences. Wat Tambor would miss his flight off of Ryloft and get captured by Republic forces. The Citadel prison was designed initially by the Galactic Republic to hold Dark Jedi within its walls. Given the natural power of Dark Side Force users, this facility had to be state-of-the-art and extremely robust. Located on a broken planet and surrounded by sulfur rivers, the Citadel was supposed to be impenetrable. Warden Ossi Sobek was placed in charge of this facility and did a terrific job upgrading the already robust defenses found on the facility. The complex had an electrified exterior wall and bioscanners that could easily detect organics. The entire prison facility was staffed by droids, making it even harder for organics to fit in. But still, the Republic would try and send a task force led by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker to rescue captured Jedi General Even Peel and Republic Captain Wilhelm Tarkin. Warden Sobek's defenses did a great job at detecting the Republic infiltration before it actually entered the facility and managed to slow down their mission considerably. His forces even managed to kill Even Peel and most of the clones attached to the mission. But the fatal mistake he would make was joining his forces on the ground in pursuit of these exceptionally deadly force users. While Ossi Sobek was a powerful fighter in his own right, he's really no match for a Jedi and a lightsaber. Look, Durd never should have stepped foot on the battlefield. He was an arms dealer by trade and not a soldier. Yet he was given the rank of general and command of a small droid force that could be used to help him develop some truly terrifying weapons. One of Lock Durd's more disturbing weapons would be the defoliator round. Launched out of a special AAT tank, the defoliator round wiped out all biological material that was caught in its vicinity. Which means grass, trees, and yes, even clones and Jedi. Look, Durd was testing this new weapon out on the planet of Meridun. After some initial test luck dirt was able to prove that not only did this weapon take out biological matter but it also didn't harm machine life at all which meant that droid commanders could now bombard the crap out of the battlefield without worrying about too many detrimental effects and friendly fire it was sort of like the opposite of the republic's own electromagnetic bomb that only harmed machines and not organics this weapon could have easily turned the tide against the Republic. And we'll later see Separatist forces using it on Dathomiri Night Sisters to great effect. But during the mission on Meridian, the Nemoidian arms developer ran across a village of peaceful Lerman and made the fatal mistake of using it as target practice. This was wholly unnecessary. I mean, previous tests already showed that this weapon was viable. And to make matters worse, a group of Jedi had found shelter in this village and were now forced to defend it against General Lok Durd's egregious actions. Play evil games, suffer evil consequences. Ultimately, Lok Durd was unable to stop the Jedi from destroying the prototype tank and arresting him. This puts an end to God knows how many more inventions he could have made if he weren't in jail. Leading the blockade of the planet of Ryloth during its occupation was Captain Murtuk, a Nemoidian officer who was quite a capable tactician with a creative flair. He specialized in perimeter defense and area denial and managed to hold off multiple attempts by the Republic to break through his lines. Despite only commanding six Munificent class frigates and one Lucre class battleship, Martuk was able to destroy several Venator class Star Destroyers. He even managed to ambush Anakin Skywalker's fleet by first drawing out their fighter coverage, which was commanded by the Green Commander Ahsoka Tano. 
Once the Republic fighter neared his own fleet, Martuk would pull in reserve frigates from hyperspace and ambush the young Jedi's formation. She would fail to return back to her own ship in time to intercept enemy droid fighters, which would lead to the destruction of another Venator-class Star Destroyer, the Redeemer. It would also heavily damage the bridge of the Resolute. The Republic would be forced to retreat from Ryloth. Now, up until this point, Captain Martuk was flawless. He had destroyed three Venator-class Star Destroyers along with endless amounts of support ships with just six lightly armed frigates and a freighter converted into a battleship. Very impressive. But ultimately, Martuk's hubris would get the best of him. Anakin Skywalker would reappear before the Separatist blockade and would offer to surrender his Star Destroyer Defender and himself in exchange for a safe passage for food and medical supplies to the surface. Took was overjoyed by this and let his guard down. He would watch in triumph as Anakin's defender started flying directly towards his blockade. It was only at the last minute that he realized that Anakin had meant to ram the ship directly at his command vessel. The ruse works and Anakin Skywalker commits one of the cardinal sins of the battlefield, abusing a truce between two sides. But the destruction of Martuk's command ship breaks the Separatist blockade. Martuk should have stayed more vigilant. It doesn't matter if Anakin says he's volunteered, I would have trained every weapon on his Venator-class Star Destroyer as it closed its distance. Any personal excitement over a victory can be enjoyed after the battle is finished. That's a completely Deshaun Jackson move. So where does Anakin get this harebrained idea to use the cover of truce to launch a sneak attack? Well, all you have to do is look at his own master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. During the Battle of Christophus, Kenobi's ground forces found themselves going toe-to-toe -to -toe with General Worm Losum. Losum was an experienced ground commander. He had served in his homeworld planetary defense force and was known for his creative strategies on the battlefield and stoicism. Under his guidance, the CIS took over the planet of Christophus and crushed all local resistance. The Republic would send a counter-invasion fleet, but before they were able to fortify their position, General Worm Losum seized the initiative and carried out an armored assault. The clones under Obi-Wan Kenobi's command fought back bravely and tried their best to halt the Seppi advance with their batteries of AV-7 anti-tank cannons. But General Losum would deploy a deflector shield to cover his advance. Without adequate armored support for their AV-7 anti-vehicle cannons, the Republic forces would get slaughtered. At this point, General Obi-Wan Kenobi was forced to negotiate a surrender with Worm Losum. Of course, the Jedi General didn't actually want to surrender. Instead, he was trying to buy more time for his forces. Ahsoka Tano and Anakin Skywalker were on a secret mission behind enemy lines to deactivate the deflector shield that was protecting the Separatist armored advance. Kenobi would meet with Worm Lovesome face to face and completely take advantage of the General's more romantic view of warfare. You see, General Lovesome believed that there was nobility in war and that opponents, especially commanders, should respect each other instead of behaving like savages. Obi-Wan Kenobi's recognition of Lovesome's abilities on the battlefield were received with delight by the tank commander. This allowed Kenobi to buy up even more valuable time. Once the deflector shields were successfully turned off, Republic forces forces would open fire on the Seppi armored columns, and Obi-Wan Kenobi would grab Worm Lovesome and take him hostage. This is all some criminal nonsense. I mean, it's good that these guys found a way to make money, but I feel like Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi are gonna be responsible for a lot of dead clone and Republic officers who were trying to surrender while using the flag of truce. Nonetheless, General Lovesome, despite his tactical and strategic brilliance, let his ego get the best of him. The truth is, in war, there are no rules. There's no nobility. There are no measures that your enemy will not take in order to survive. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.